going to get back into our Father's Word today. We're, we're kind of taking the subject again, and this will probably be the last segment of seed planting. <clears throat> Telling the layperson how to approach someone when the, or to how to answer someone, how to plant a seed when the opportunity prevails. First of all, before you can share share the Word of God, you must be at least somewhat familiar with it. As I stipulated in the first half of this lecture, it is well for you to put notes on subjects. Some people use colors to keep up, uh, let's say that grace is blue, and or that that pertains to Christ, blue being royal, is that color is used. And some people like to use rectangles, triangles, various um, symbols to to put the next reference you'll be using. That way you don't have to memorize necessarily every verse in the Bible. It gives you a, a little edge on memory. And then as you teach that, the best way in the world to learn is to teach. But before you can teach, you must know what God's Word is speaking about. Because it's a very serious thing to mislead people. So having said that, we went into the topic of seed planting itself as to how there would be some, one method being, that some would say, well, why would Jesus say, get away from me, I know you not, after they said, I, I healed in your name. And we found out why he was saying there are many false prophets and teachers out in the world. Beware of them. How do you read them? By testing the fruit of their tree. And that is, to, in some people's minds, an oversimplification, but it's called common sense. And anytime you get away from common sense, you're going to plow into deep murk, and probably it'll be over your head. So, we remember from the simplicity in which God himself, first when the Spirit moved upon the waters, this particular earth age was formed, and he put man in the garden, and he said to Adam, hey, don't partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The other trees you can partake of. So again, we go back to trees and fruit. And therefore, uh, we see the simplicity of understanding. You see, that's discernment. Being able to discern the word. I want to follow up on that. How would you teach that? How would you teach where does the word Kenite come from? Well, first of all, you would need a Strong's Concordance to document that K-E-N-I-T-E -E meant, it has only one meaning, sons of Cain. And they're still with us today. And you have to, you have, to have the ability in a simple, inexpensive, very inexpensive Strong's Concordance will help you go back to the Hebrew and document that point. Christ would talk again about seed planting. He gave a parable of the sower. And we would find that in Mark chapter 4, verse 11. I want to go there as we ask a word of wisdom from our Father and let's continue. How do you plant seeds? Always remember this one thing. Before anyone can gain an interest in a certain thing, you have to show them that they have a part in it. It's very important. It will not be interesting. How, what does that mean to me? Always share that point of how God calls some and some choose God and so forth. And put the person, it, it, this is a living word and make it live for that entity. Okay, seed planting, the sower, parable, Mark chapter 4. Let's pick it up with May with verse 11 and it reads, And he said unto them, Unto you, this is the disciples, okay? Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without all these things are done in parables. What he was doing was speaking in a parable about sowing seeds. And they said, why do you always talk in parables? Why don't you just speak straight forward out what you're talking about? And what he's saying here, it's not given that everybody should know. And that's one of the most important things you must recognize about planting seeds. 
Just as sure as it was for the disciples, so it is for you today that not everybody has eyes or ears, eyes to see and ears to hear the mysteries of the kingdom of God. I don't care how simple you make it, many of them cannot see it. That's when you just pack up and pull out. It's no, it does not matter if they're not in, if it's not meant for them to hear, it's better that they do not at this time. Let God cause the growth after you do, or the germination, after you plant the seed. That's something you have no power over. Okay? So he's explaining why he spoke in parables. Verse 12. The people that could not see, that the, 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 this is why he does it in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive. They're not going to understand. And hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sin should be forgiven them. In other words, what is the unforgivable sin? It's real easy to understand this. The unforgivable sin is to refuse the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak through you, as it is written in Luke chapter 12, verse 10, when you are delivered up before the spurious Messiah. That's unforgivable. If they don't have the guts to make a stand, to stand for that that is right, then it would be very unfair for the very fact they couldn't see in the first place to have to answer to something that they could understand. So always remember that. Verse 13, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? Can't you understand it? You're my students. And how then will you know all parables. In other words, if you don't understand this parable of the sower, the seed planting, you're not going to understand any of my parables. That's what Christ basically is saying here. 14, listen to the simplicity of it. The sower soweth the word. So it is the word of God that you sow. You broadcast it. That's what we do on television, on shortwave radio. That's how the God's word is spread. It is you broadcast it as you would seed. Take a handful of seed and swath it, uh, whereby uh, you cover large areas of ground sowing God's word. We know that sometimes some of the seed falls on a hard stone and it can't take root and it dies and so on and so forth. And the parable explains that. But first, I, we had mentioned the trees in the garden. We had mentioned testing man's fruit to know them. By their fruits you shall know them. Let's go back if we may. Let's take the thought, Kenite. How could I possibly plant a seed? Well, first you would have to have the knowledge. Where do we, where do we attain that? It's back in Genesis. You go to the beginning. No one can understand the end of God's word without understanding the beginning. And um, so we're going to go there. We're going to understand how do we document who a Kenite is? If, if there are evil trees cannot produce good fruit, where did the evil tree come from? Well, you've got to know that. All right? Let's find out. Chapter 3, the book of Genesis, verse 1, and it reads, Now the serpent. Well, who is this serpent? Well, let's see. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. That old serpent, the dragon, who is the devil. In other words... It is his name. You'll find it again in Revelation chapter 20. That old serpent, the dragon, it's the devil. All right? This same serpent here is not a snake. All right? This, the old serpent was more subtle than any beast, that's to say living creature of the field. What field? The field is the world which the Lord God had made and he said unto the woman, the old the, the devil. Again, if you don't believe the serpent's the devil, turn to Revelation chapter 20 right now and read the first two verses in the chapter so that you know uh, snakes don't talk, honey. All right? The devil does, and he is a serpent. Okay? Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Now let's stop right there. 
God said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. And we're talking here about apple trees. Uh, people say Eve ate an apple and that was a sin. No, she could eat all the apples she wanted, as long as they weren't too green and, you know, were in pretty good standing and not too many worms in them, this sort of thing. Yeah, she could have all the, tr all the apples she wanted. Now, let's get real, all right? <clears throat> It's important that you understand the word trees, or there's no way you're going to understand what God is teaching concerning, uh, through Christ, the testing of the fruit. So, let's pull up, if we may, this word trees here in the Hebrew. Let's pull it up, if we may, on the screen. It's the word 6086 in the Hebrew dictionary. And... Um, We'll have that there in a moment, perhaps. I hope we do. We don't have it. All right. Well, then I'll have to give it to you. Is, do we have it later on, may I ask? Is it okay? Uh, at what verse? Just tell me what verse it follows, the, the Hebrew. Uh, pardon? We're going to have it after. Okay. Well, I'll go on to the next verse, and we'll see if they can find it there, Okay. Then let's, let's go, if we may, right on with the next verse, verse 3. Okay? So we have it here in verse... Here we got it. All right. There we go. There we have it. Let's pull up, then, if we may, 6086. Okay? I think I saw it there on the screen. Okay, we have 6095. Okay? Um, I need 6086. I believe it was right before that. Or is it behind? I'm sorry it got out of sequence. The prime root is, okay, okay, let's go with 6095 then, all right, in the Hebrew. This is, um, okay, well, just throw up any of the Hebrew numbers. It doesn't matter. I'll take it from there. I'll just play it by ear. Throw up any, we lost it, okay. Well, it would seem, well, okay, let's go with Genesis 3.3. And we'll get back with it, and I'll, I'll just play it by ear as it comes, and if not, I'll explain the Hebrew just by word. But we continue. She said, you can eat all the trees, but, Eve says, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, we have a strange thing here. And um, what does this mean? There's one particular tree you can't bother. One particular tree you can't touch. And that's this tree that's in the midst of the garden. Now, first of all, I'm hoping that we have a Hebrew word here for touch, naga. Do we? Yeah, there it is. What does it mean? You, this, this is what the Hebrew manuscripts have as naga, and it means... This is what you're not supposed to do with that particular tree, which is to say touch. Naga being that word. A primitive, or it's the prime verb, it, uh, the pro uh, property, or uh, to touch, to lie, to lay the hand upon for any purpose, to lie with a woman. All right? So we see that intercourse itself is involved within this, all right? And there, there you have the word to touch. It doesn't say necessarily to eat, all right? And, and we'll just drop that from the screen there, okay? Now, what is it we're not supposed to touch? And I'm going to go for the Hebrew uh, word, if I may, another Hebrew word at this time, and I don't know if we have them or not. If not, I'm going to just explain them. Uh, the Hebrew word... Uh, 6086, can we have it? Or any one you have? We don't have any more, okay? Oh, we do. Okay, do, well, should I go one more verse and then we'll find it? Okay, here it comes right now, okay? Let's see where we're at. Oh, okay, real good. That's where I wanted. Atesh in the Hebrew. It's a prime root. All right, let's roll it there. Properly to uh, carve, fabricate, or fashion, hence, in a bad sense, to worry. Now, if we can, I'd like to back that back up to get its prime, 
because it has a prime and it's from 6095, 6095, all right? That's where it's from, really. And um, um, it, uh, or let's go with 6096 if we have it. We're going to have it, okay? It would seem that we have a little bit of a mix up here. 6095 from Atesh, Atash, a prime root properly to fasten, to make firm, to close the eyes. Now that's what's important that you know. Now watch this as we slide on to another word from this word trees, uh, from the prime. Atish, to the spine is giving firmness to the body. And that's, that's all I needed. You can go ahead and drop it there now. It's the backbone. That's why that this particular tree, which is to say the serpent himself, with the central nervous system going through that tree, and with this being the limbs and this the trunk of the body, and certainly an opening or a closing of the eyes from this same prime root, you begin to have a little eye and naga, don't touch it, don't lie with the woman. All right? So we begin to see that spiritually and physically, we have a great deal more here to go on. Okay, now let's go with the fourth verse of this same chapter. And the serpent, following this, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. You're not going to die if you do this. Of course, he's a liar. You've got to watch him. He'll do it to you today as well. What had God said about it? In the day you eat thereof, you'll die. An old uh, the serpent, uh, Satan, jumps on it, and he said, You won't die, the liar. Now listen to verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Atesh. The backbone, your eyes will be open. Of course, he's lying again because it closes your eyes to God's kingdom. Do you remember the Hebrew word? It's important that you have a strong, that you're able to go in whereby you can discern we're not eating an apple here. All right? Surely, Satan says, your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, knowing sin. All right? That's, that's what they would know. That's what they would understand. Verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, I mean, it was pleasant. I mean, after all, uh, as king of Tyre, as Satan is described, his description is in Ezekiel chapter 28. He was the most beautiful of all the archangels. And a man, all right, as angels were able to cohabit with, to lie with a woman, as is documented in Genesis chapter 6, where the fallen angels came to the earth and giants were born because of the hybrids born from the, the, um, the uh, joining. All right, so wake up. We're not talking about apples. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, the eye of the mind, the sensation of it, and the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. In other words, I received many questions. Well, what did he do? He partook of the same food that Eve partook of. All right? No, it's not recorded past that. Satan can be whatever he chooses to be. Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened. Ah, Tesh. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, what did it say here that Satan came up and he has a bushel of real bright, pretty red apples all polished up? And he hands over one to Eve and says, here, have an apple. They're on special today. Stop lying to your children. You, that's, it is absolutely past the point of being ridiculous. To lie in a very house of God to young people about what happened in the garden. If you don't understand the beginning, you're not going to understand any of Christ's parables to their full depth. And probably many people misunderstand this teaching 
quite frankly, because, well, that just isn't really very nice. So you're too good for God? You're too, you're too good. Your house of God is too good for God to enter in his truth, his word. Then I guarantee you he will leave. You will not have him there. If you teach lies about polished apples and so forth, you can forget it. God will not bless those that lie concerning his word. And furthermore, how, if had they eaten an apple... Would they not have made a mask to put over the sin of their mouth where they ate that messy, big, red, delicious apple? No. They took fig leaves, sewed aprons because they were naked of those private parts that we usually do not make public. As a matter of fact, if you were to crack open a Webster's Dictionary today, and you were to look up a complete one and look up fig leaf, it still to this day means to hide or conceal something. This is why Jesus would say, learn the parable of the fig tree. This is where it started. It wasn't in an apple orchard. It was in a fig grove. And that's why the fig leaves. So wake up. Stop lying to children and teach God's word as it is written. Okay, they may, knowing then that they were naked, verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. They ran and hid. Why? They were ashamed. 9, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now they were innocent up to this time that Satan got into the plan of God, the woman through who Christ would eventually umbilical cord to umbilical cord come, and that's what Satan's plan was, was to mess up the birthright of Messiah himself. All right, verse uh, uh, 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Listen to this. 11, and he said, God speaking, Who told thou that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Question. I don't know, friend. When you allow people to absolutely insult your intelligence with Betty Bye, Pie in the Sky, and Apple stories, I wonder sometimes, why people are not afraid of our Father today that do not respect Him for the common sense and the teachings of Christ as to far as testing the fruit of the tree. Check out this tree. Verse 12, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Kind of passing the buck here a little bit. Be that as it may, nothing new under the sun. 13, and the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? Question. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. The serpent came up with a bushel of apples and polished one for me. Now if you make a note, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Paul teaching. What Eve lost here was her virginity. And Paul uses this word beguiled in the Greek in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, which means to be wholly seduced. Check it out for yourself. Verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, that means all living things, and above every beast of the field, every living creature, Break it back to the Hebrew so that you better understand and get fairy tales out of your eyes, okay? Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. A figure of speech, a Hebrew idiom that means a place or a state of degradation. The lowest of the low. We even have the saying today, lower in a snake's belly. Now what, what actually happened here? Pastor Murray, do you mean to tell me that you're saying naga to lie with a woman, touch, 
That's what God was talking about. Let's see how intelligent you are. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Here we go back to this seed planning again. Between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. Well, what are we talking about? It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, Christ would come through this woman, that is to say her offspring. That was God's plan. And his heels were bruised in as much as they were nailed to the cross. And the deadly wound that Satan will receive in his head has not happened yet, but it shall when he walks into the lake of fire. The seed is the male sperma, in the, in, in, and it is a child. That's what we're talking about. Verse 16, want it a little clearer? Stand by. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Conception had taken place. Do you understand what conception is? It's not tummy ache from green apples. All right? In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And of course it continues on. And... Um, and the tree of life would be mentioned and they would be driven from the garden. The tree of life naturally is Christ. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is Satan. They were not able to partake at this time of salvation. Christ would have to be born of this woman, offspring, and pay the price and then salvation would be available for all men. Now we have a strange thing in chapter 4 and and once you teach what I have just reiterated to you you're going to have someone that's going to read this these next two verses after chapter 4 in in uh, English and they're going to misunderstand so let's cover them and Adam chapter 4 verse 1 and Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bear Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Well, now, according to that, it states right there, Adam knew Eve, that means that he lay with her, and she conceived, and Cain was the offspring. Well, that really isn't what it says totally. Let's read verse 2. Ish it Yahweh, with the help of God, ish it Yahweh. And this is the first time the word man is used in Genesis where it is ish, rather than autumn. Verse 2, And she again, I want you to circle that word again, and again bear his brother Abel. Again in the Hebrew is Yasaf, and it means she continued in labor. They were twins, in other words. And bear his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. You continue on, and you'll find out that they both become of age at the same time that they both bring their offering at God at the same time because they were twins, not identical twins by the same fathers. Okay, but uh, otherwise, ask your medical doctor. It's very possible and happens over and over and over. Anyway, Cain had a mark placed upon him after he murdered this one Abel. And with that mark upon him, you have the original and the beginning of the mark of the beast. God, Christ told you, not maybe you should understand the parable of the fig tree. He said, learn it. This is the root of it in this chapter. Also, the mark placed upon Cain is basically the uh, beginning of the mark of the beast, if you would. And... Quite frankly, if you want to take the time, make a quick note of the word count as it is used in Revelation chapter 13, verse, verse 17 or 18. 18, I guess. Uh, count the number of the beast. Tells you how to enumerate his identity. Check that word count out in the Greek and you will see it's that in the Greek it is to enumerate by using stones to the lot or worn smooth over a long period of time all the way back to the beginning my friend now 
Then following that in this fourth chapter, you have Cain's genealogy. That's to say his progeny, his offspring. Beginning over in chapter 5 or verse 25 of this, but basically in chapter 5, you have Adam's genealogy. Why, then I ask you this, why isn't Cain's genealogy in Adam's genealogy? Wasn't he a child of Adam? No. Therefore, he is not written in the word of God in Adam's genealogy. Why? He was not the son of Adam. It's that simple. How many people misunderstand because they do not understand the simplicity in which God's word is written? How simple. Well, did Christ ever teach this? Oh, yes, many, many times. In St. John chapter 8, in verse 44, he would tell those Kenites that claimed to be of our brother Judah and were not, he would tell them that they were the offspring of the first murderer. Do you know who the first murderer is? It was Cain. They were Kenites. And then he makes it very clear. Ye are of your father the devil. And he was not speaking spiritually. He was talking about seed. So there you have it. That's the way you plant seeds. I guarantee you that causes people to take an interest because the Kenite is still present today. You're not supposed to bother them. You're supposed to leave them alone. But they are in the world today. Nothing to be afraid of. We have power and a victory over anyone that comes in your direction. Let's turn real quickly to Matthew 13. I want to know, does God, through Christ, teach this in another place? The answer is, of course he does. And it has to do with the parable of the seed planter. You will note in this 13th chapter of Matthew that, um, uh, he, again, the, the thought comes forth of the parable. He says, why in the 10th verse, why do you always say these things in parables? And he will say the same thing that he did in Mark so that it's not meant that they understand. But we find then in verse 24 of this 13th chapter of Mark, the parable of the sower. If you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of them. Let's get with it. Verse 24 of Mark th Matthew 13. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Do you know how to sow seed, my friend? Let me make it clear to you now. The, the field is the world, and the seed are the children of God, Adam and Eve, and the other peoples. Verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. These are Kenites, the sons of Cain. Zawan, in actuality, the technical name for them, they look like wheat but they are poisonous. So it is in real life. 26, But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also, meaning it was poison then. All right? Very poison. 27, So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? Question. From whence then hath it tares? Where did this poison come from? 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Should we kill these Kenites? Should we get rid of them? Verse 29. But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye rid up also the wheat with them. Leave the Kenites alone. Recognize them? Yes. But leave them alone. They fulfill a negative part. Skip on with me real quickly, if you would, down to the 34th verse. Christ is going to explain that parable. We're not speaking in a parable here. He's going to explain one. Listen to it. 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. 35 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept 
secret from the foundations of the world. We could spend an hour there. That's the kibel, the overthrow, Satan's fall. Been kept secret from there. 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away. And he went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the terrors in the field. Explain that thing to us. He's going to. Do you have eyes to see and ears to hear? <laughs> or do you like apples? You know, do you enjoy God's word? That's the seed we sow. Then hear the word of the Lord. 37. He answered and said to them, He that sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. That is to say, Christ, the living word. God himself when the Spirit moved. 38. The field is the world. The field is what? It's the world. It's that same field you're supposed to remain working in until the true Christ returns. The good seed are the children. No, it's supposed to be apples. Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. Shouldn't say children there at all. Should say apples. Something wrong somewhere. You bet there's something wrong somewhere. Children. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The wicked one. Who, who possibly could the wicked one be? The serpent? The dragon? Who is this wicked one? 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Isn't that a deep mystery? All right. Can you understand that? The enemy that sowed those children, not apples, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. They'll take care of it on judgment day. That's what he's saying. Verse 40, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. We're going to stop there in this lecture. That's it. How do you plant seeds? By sowing God's word, planting God's word. And don't apologize for it. And if no one has eyes to see or ears to hear, don't worry about them. Pray for them. Be sweet to them. They're nice people, but they love apples. All right? They got apple-itis in their eyes. But you happen to be the apple of God's eye. As it is written in that great song of Moses that the overcomers sing who get the victory over the fig tree as well as the mark of the beast, written in Revelation 15, that they are in fact the apple of God's eye, meaning his very pupil of the eye of God, therefore he protects you in that respect. It's a strange thing, but probably, probably your so-called Christian community criticize me more for teaching what I have just taught, the Word of God, than any other thing. They would rather tell fairy stories. Be that as it may, that doesn't bother me one iota. It is God's truth. And I will either teach the truth or I will not teach at all. I marvel at how many people love fairy tales and Apple Pan Dowdy makes their face light up when they all say howdy to lies and false teachers. Teachers that have not the ability to dig into the language when it's such a simple thing. See that you be a servant of God and not of false traditions. Don't be a liar to little children. Teach it on their level as they understand. For if they understand the word of God in the beginning, they'll never forget how it closes in the end. They will have eyes to see and ears to hear. Never worry if one does not have eyes to see or hear. Pass that one over and let God deal with them. But never stop planting seeds. Okay, let's get into some questions here. What do we have first up? David from California. How does a man re rebuild the broken trust with a woman? Well, it's real simple. The main thing is be very honest, record her, that is to love her. But it takes time, which means what? 
time after time after time, as time goes by through the years, you're going to have to prove yourself to her that you have the ability to deserve to be trustworthy. All women are so sweet and they really like to forgive, but you have to earn it first. Okay, Jenny from Utah. It says in Revelation that Satan is to be released after 1,000 years. Why is this? Well, because he's, he's locked up for 1,000 years and many people are taught. They, didn't, they, were, they were blinded. They didn't have eyes to see or ears to hear. And God's not going to fry anyone in ignorance. They're going to be brought to the full knowledge. Well, is that a second chance? Absolutely not. They didn't, by what is taught about red apples and, and the good Lord only knows what else in the traditions of men, they didn't have a chance to start with. How could they understand parables when they didn't have a teacher? Therefore, they will be taught in the millennium. And God doesn't give any free rides. They have to be tested even as you are tested today by Satan. That's why he's released. Lola from Florida. You once said on your program that when we die, righteously that is, our spirits go to heaven. But I was, I was taught that no one goes to heaven. Please explain John 3.13 since this is the verse that I was taught this from. Well, John 3.13, that is very strange. I, I don't know what, I am probably am getting on some denomination's toes here, but, I, but it doesn't matter. John 3.13, if my memory doesn't fail me, says only those that ascend, can, can, only those who descended may ascend back to heaven. Well, all of us but the fallen angels did that. Where, Lola, where did your soul come from? Out from under a rock or out of some well? It came from God. It came from heaven. And your soul is yourself. All Christ was saying is that he ascended and he's going back. And all the rest of us are as well. That's all it means. I don't know how that anyone could teach that particular verse as not the soul not returning to heaven if they didn't believe they came from there. And I don't know where that church would be teaching that people got their souls unless it's out of a rock somewhere or something like that rather than from God. So they're, they're, I'm sorry, you have been lied to and deceived in the past by some particular tradition. Not so. Check it back to the Greek for yourself, my dear, what, what did that? Real quickly, why did Christ say that? Because the Nephilim, the fallen angels, left their place of habitation on their own. They were not born of woman. Therefore, by refusing to be born of woman, that is to say to descend as God had planned, they convicted themselves to death without even judgment day coming to pass. Read the first four verses of Jude. The first six verses of Jude. Nadine from Colorado, could you please tell me how much authority does an elder and a pastor have when it comes to a person leaving the congregation? They don't have any authority. Um, Christ is your authority. You don't have to, if you for some reason have decided to leave a particular group or church, Shake, kick the dust off your feet and get out. They have no authority whatsoever. Now, some of these revolving revs will say, you have offended a very holy person. Well, I'll tell you what. No man is holy. Only God is holy. And I know that may shock some, but our very best, our holiest of holies, man's that is, is as filthy rags compared to the righteousness of God who is truly holy. Don't, don't let these knuckleheads give you a hard time. They don't speak for God necessarily. If, um, if they have told you this, they are in error. All right? I don't care who they are or what church it is. They've got no business talking to you that way, and they're a bunch of liars. 
And that may upset some too, but be that as it may, Christ heads the church. Do you know how you join this particular church? I can't, I can't let you in or out. I can't tell you to go. Or I can't tell you to come in. You have to take that up with Christ himself. And if Christ says you're okay, you're my buddy. You're my friend. If Christ tells you to go, then you'll have to go. But it's he that must do it, not, not this man or some other man. Now, if a troublemaker come in, I'll throw him out, all right? But, um, you know, causing upset or anything like that. But nobody, nobody, as far as the church itself and the leader being Christ, have any authority to tell someone to leave or stay as long as they're not creating difficulties. And hey, there are many churches that so they do you the best favor in the world to throw you out if God's word isn't taught there. Patricia from Virginia, explain once saved, always saved doctrine versus Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 9. Hebrews 6, 4 through 9 the preceding verses, Paul said, you go to church for 20 years and you used to have need again of a teacher because you haven't had anything but milk. So that's salvation and baptism. Salvation and baptism over and over. You've been saved and you've been baptized, but that's still all you're taught. Get saved, get baptized. Get saved, get baptized. You already have been. He said it's like re-crucifying Christ all over again when all of God's word should be taught. It's like re-crucifying Christ to teach people that they've got to be saved for 50 years when they've already taken the step rather than giving them the meat of God's word. He said you must become perfect. That word perfect in verse 1 of that chapter means matured. That means get a little common sense and mature in God's word. John from Tennessee. Uh, man has been off drugs for over two years. Comment, it's been four years, five months and 16 days, thanks to you and all, and of course, thanks the Lord. Well, God's word will bring you off those things. Congratulations, John. I'm glad you're a part of us, and I'm glad that God's word has changed your life. Thank God for it. You are one of many thousands that God's word taught chapter by chapter, give the courage to stand up and be a child of God. God bless you. We love you and we're glad to have you with us. Uh, Dorsey from Kentucky. In Malachi 3.9, my pastor teaches that we pay our tithes to the church. Can you tell me what the storehouse is? Where do our tithes go? Where should they be given? Wherever you're taught God's word, all right? Naturally, that's God's way of reaching you. If it's your home church or let's say it's this particular ministry, then if you're taught half of it there and half of it here, that's the way it goes because you must keep that word coming to you. If you don't, it won't be. It'll be cut off. So that's the way you do it. And it's supposed to, it's supposed to be utilized to feed you and others. All right? Earl from Pennsylvania. First John says, he who is born of God does not sin. This confuses me because I know Christians sin. Well, that's one of those little words the translators probably could have translated with a little more clarity. The, from the Greek, it means um, that uh, he that is born of God is not an habitual sinner. Qualify it. An habitual sinner is somebody that does not want to do right, doesn't care about doing right, and cares neither about God, the world, or anything. They just don't care. One that's born of God is never an habitual sinner that doesn't care about anything. They may, they'll sin, but it will not be, they will not be an habitual sinner. How do I, this is Michelle or Michael from Arkansas. How do I make my relatives understand I don't want to celebrate Easter with them and their traditions? Is there somewhere in the Bible I can show them? What is the Easter tape? It gives you the knowledge and the wisdom to explain or to help them know why that it's Passover to you and not Easter and, and give you the knowledge and wisdom to be able to document it. But don't turn on your relatives just because of that. 
you know, and except for the grace of God, there go you anyway rolling Easter eggs. All right? Just, just be patient, be loving, and uh, always enjoy your relatives. They're the ones God chose to place you with. Be patient.